Hey everyone, welcome to Cardiovascular Emergencies. Overall, 19 questions on the CEN exam come from cardiovascular emergencies. That's 12.5% of the 150 questions that'll count towards your final score. So, that makes this the largest area on the exam. Yup, you're going to want to spend some time studying this area, and you're also going to find that this is probably the longest lecture in the series, which makes sense since the most number of questions come from here. So, without any further delay, let's get at it. Now, like we're going to do in all the other modules, I'm going to start with a challenge question. Now remember, the challenge questions are found at the end of the study manual if you want to follow along with the challenge questions and mark the correct answers. And if for some reason you miss an answer, just remember you can find the answers to these for free on our website. All right, here we go. First challenge question, ready? Administering medications which increase cardiac contractility will cause a, a reduction in preload, B, a decreased afterload, C, an elevation in heart rate, or D, an increased stroke volume. Now I'm going to give you the answer in a little bit, but let's go through the material first before I give you the answer. So here we go. I want to just start with some basic cardiovascular physiology, just to kind of lay out what we're going to be talking about really throughout the entire cardiovascular lecture. So let's review how the cardiovascular system works. Remember, everything we do with the cardiovascular system is really meant to maintain a good cardiac output. Now remember what a cardiac output is. A cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood ejected from the left ventricle each minute. I don't know why you'd ever do this, but let's say you could take a heart and put it above a bucket, and every time the heart beats, the blood that was um, ejected out of the heart would come into the bucket. By the end of one minute, you would have somewhere between four and eight liters of blood in that bucket, and that's cardiac output. So a normal cardiac output for an adult is four to eight liters per minute. That's how much blood is ejected out of your left ventricle per minute if you're healthy. And your goal in caring for patients is to make sure that they have a cardiac output of somewhere between 4 and 8 liters, depending, of course, on their body size and other factors. Now, two things make up your cardiac output. Your cardiac output is made up first of stroke volume. Now, stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected from the left ventricle per contraction. So again, if we use my analogy, which is kind of silly, but putting a heart above a bucket, when the heart contracts, the amount of blood that would be in the bucket after a single contraction would be stroke volume. Now on a healthy adult, that would equate to somewhere between 50 and 100 mLs of blood. So stroke volume, 50 to 100 mLs, and cardiac output, somewhere between four and eight liters. Now the other component of cardiac output is the heart rate. Now remember, heart rate obviously is the number of times your heart beats per minute. So think about it. If you know how much blood is ejected per contraction, and you know how, much, how many times the heart beats per minute, if you simply multiply the heart rate by the stroke volume, you get cardiac output. That's how we do cardiac output. We can figure out stroke volume by doing an ejection fraction, and then we multiply that by the patient's heart rate, and we end up with the patient's cardiac output. Now, three things make up stroke volume. So stroke volume is composed of preload, afterload, and contractility. Now, look at the prefix of these to kind of help you figure out what they are. Preload, the prefix of course being pre, and we know that pre means before. So preload is the amount of blood coming into the heart. It's, it's what's filling the heart. It's, it's, the, it's the stuff before. Sometimes when I'm teaching advanced cardiovascular uh, concepts, I will talk about a bathtub. So let's use that analogy right now. So think about a bathtub. If you want to have a bath, you need enough water in the tub so that it's full. Otherwise, you're going to be cold if it's only half full, right? But you don't want too much water in the tub. Otherwise, it's going to flow over the sides all over the floor. So you need just the right amount of water in a bathtub. Well, your heart's not a lot different. 
you need just the right amount of water in, or just the amount, the, the amount of blood in your heart, right? If you have too much um, blood, you're going to overstretch the ventricles and they lose contractility. But if you don't have enough blood, you won't stretch them enough to allow for that contractility. So you need just the right amount of blood coming into the heart to stretch the heart to the appropriate um, size for that adequate contraction, okay? So you can see how the two are kind of the same. The heart has to have the right amount of blood, just like the bathtub has to have the right amount of water. Now, let's keep using that analogy. So preload, it's what's coming into, it's the filling pressure. So let's go back to the bathtub. What would the filling pressure or what would, what would be the system that fills the tub? What's the preload on the tub? If you said the faucet, you're correct. The faucet's what fills the tub. So if we take that same analogy to the heart, what would the faucet be on the right side of the heart? What's filling the right side of the heart? Well, if you said something like vena cava, you got it correct. The vena cava is like the faucet that's filling the right side. Now, how do we measure pressures in the vena cava? Well, CVP, your central venous pressures are pressures in the vena cava. So if you're doing hemodynamic monitoring, then your, um, your um, right ventricular preload would be your central venous pressure because that's the pressures in the vena cava and that's what's filling the heart. Now I know that a lot of emergency departments don't use uh, hemodynamics. So if you don't use hemodynamics, kind of the crude measurement you can use for preload on the right is JVD, jugular venous distension. Because of course, if blood backs up out of the right ventricle because preload is really high, where is it gonna back up into? into the jugulars and you're going to get JVD. So elevated JVD is a sign of high right ventricular preload because the blood's backing up out of that right ventricle. Now let's keep the analogy going. What would the preload or the faucet be on the left side of the heart? What, what fills the left side? Now if you said something with pulmonary um, circulation, you got it correct, because of course the pulmonary circulation dumps into the left ventricle, much like a faucet into a tub. Now how do we measure pressures in the pulmonary circulation? Pulmonary wedge pressures, right? So if you're doing hemodynamic monitoring, your wedge pressures are going to be a measurement of left ventricular preload. Now how would we measure it if we don't have hemodynamic monitoring? JVD is not going to work here, right? Instead, we use lung sounds because if you have a lot of uh, pressure in the pulmonary circulation, the fluid's going to leak into the lungs and you're going to get crackles and other signs of pulmonary edema. So we could use lung sounds as the crude measurement of left ventricular preload. So as a summary, right ventricular preload can be measured hemodynamically using central venous pressures and if you don't have hemodynamic monitoring, then you can use JVD as a crude measurement. On the left side, if you're using hemodynamic monitoring, you would use a pulmonary wedge pressure. If you don't have hemodynamic monitoring, then you could use lung sounds as the crude measurement. So that's preload.